pleasure to be with you. Uh, we have really enjoyed the past year and a half as we've been traveling around developing partnerships with local churches, and it's been uh, particularly encouraging to hear men like your pastor share the, the heartbeat of this local church and, and of others that we've gotten to know to partner with other gospel workers. You probably noticed, and I hope you noticed, was the way that God is shaping a framework scripturally to give us insight into what he wants us to do. If we think about the missionary task, on the one hand, it's, um, it's absurd. It's difficult. Should we really do it? It takes a lot of time. It costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of effort to learn another language and adjust to another culture. Is it really worth it? Well, we see in Scripture that it is because Jesus Christ is Lord over all. And his message is one of global proportions. That's what we'll see in, in Isaiah 49 this morning. And he is the one working through a local church, local churches around the world, to take those that are faithfully serving there and send some of them out, like he did with Barnabas and Saul, to the work that he called them to. And once they go, and as they're going, they need people to partner with them in that work, to be praying for them, supporting them financially, coming alongside where they can to work in the same ministries. And, and as God outworks that in and around the world, the gospel goes to different people, and we see that his task as he works through the local church and as God, the Lord of the harvest, chooses through the Holy Spirit and through the leadership of the local church and sends those people out, he sends us out with his authority and with this, this promise that he makes, like we hear in Acts chapter 1, that he says, when, go back to Jerusalem, he's telling the disciples, they want to know, is it, is it the right time that you're going to establish your kingdom? And that would have been a very uh, normal thing for, the, for them to be thinking. You're the Messiah, is it time that you're going to establish your, your kingdom? Are you going to rule and reign, just as we know Scripture says that you will? He says, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. Go back to Jerusalem and wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And when he comes in power in your life, when he fills you, and when he empowers you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth, to the ends of the earth. And we might think of that and think just about geography, and I think that's certainly a part of it. What we should realize, though, is what he's doing. He's making the prophecy that in every successive generation, as his disciples go out, and we are, if we're in Christ, we're in that number of disciples, we go knowing that he sends us out to be his witnesses, to testify of him, who he is and what he's done, and, and to do that in, in spirit, power, being empowered by the Spirit of God. You might think sometimes, you might wonder, could I actually be a witness for Jesus Christ? And as you think about talking with other people, sometimes you think, that'd be awkward, that'd be difficult, I don't know how they would respond. It really comes down to this. Am I being filled with the Spirit? Am I walking in the Spirit? Am I allowing the Word of Christ to take up residence in me? If I walk in the Spirit, I won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. And if that's true in our life, that we're filled with the Spirit, we're saying yes to what the Spirit says yes to, the natural overflow of a, type, of a life like that is someone that speaks about Jesus Christ. Not perfectly, not without faults, not without some fear and trembling, but speaks with clarity because they know the one they're proclaiming is the one and only Savior. And so I appreciate your, your encouragement to us and as, as you've talked with us and uh, your prayers for us. Uh, we are so glad to be here. We'll look for more opportunities to be back with you and get to know you. As What we've seen is that um, if there's not a partnership, and a partnership doesn't develop unless you spend time with people, as you know from your own friendships, you, you spend time with people, you get to know them, you get to know what they like, what they don't like, you get to know how they live their life. You spend time with people, you get to know who they are. You get to know, in the Christian community, you get to know how to pray for one another. That's what it takes here in this body of local believers. If you don't interact with one another, you just come and see one another and, and go your own ways, and not much actual ministry will be taking place. And we've seen that in the short term and certainly more the case in the long term as God in God's time when we end up in Peru will be thousands of miles away from here. And so we want to, and God's been so gracious to give us opportunities to spend time with local churches. We have a network of about 20 local churches we've been getting to know over the, um, the about 15 years that God's been directing Kelly and me into missions and they're all here on the East Coast. So it's given us opportunities to visit and revisit and get to know people. Some of those churches like this one God connected us to uh, in, his, in his own sovereign plan. 
uh, back in, I think it was September, we were at Community Baptist Church in South Riding, Virginia. Uh, the, Connie's parents are there. Connie's um, father is a pastor of that church. And there was a missions emphasis Sunday. Similar to this one, I had a few minutes to speak. And um, your pastor, Pastor Shipe, and I connected after the service and had uh, many things in common and developed a friendship there just after a few minutes and invited us to come up here. We found an opportunity to do that and uh, have been really excited to, to get to know them and see what God's doing here. And we thank God for that. And most of the other cases, the churches that we are getting to know better have been through friendships, uh, pastor friends of mine that have been getting to know or I've known for a long time, or seminary professors of mine that are pastors, and uh, it's been really uh, neat to see God bringing it all together. We're praying that we can be moved to Peru by uh, July or August of this year. That certainly would have be something we would depend on the Lord for. Uh, we're around 60% of our targeted budget at this point with uh, six churches and 10 families, and we're praying from that number of 14 other churches that God will bring along the right partnering team to send us down to Peru and keep us there uh, in his timing. So I appreciate uh, your prayers along those lines. And we know that as we pray, if we'll pray that God's kingdom will come, that his kingdom will be manifested here and that his will will be done, if we're praying with that kind of focus, he'll answer and it'll be to, to his glory. And so as God works out the details and gives us insight of where we can best serve him in Peru. Uh, that takes time for him to reveal that to us. Um, we want to be dependent upon his, his spirit and his word to know what he wants us to be about and um, be in contact with the people down in Peru. Um, God has been directing us there since, particularly to Peru, since 2006. I did an internship there for eight weeks um, after my junior year in college, and that was where God focused in on a particular part and South America where we would have me focus. Well, Kelly and I were dating at that point. We got married after we graduated from college in 2007. We went back in 2009 for a couple weeks in 2010 for a couple months. Some of the pictures you saw on the video were from those trips. In particular, in 2010, we took a month to go to the jungle. And um, the neat thing about the way God's been directing us is that God had put on Kelly's heart and mind and interest in serving him in missions, particularly in South America, with her life even before we met. So I haven't been having to pull her and drag her by the hair and uh, coerce her into going. It's been God uh, doing the work. And one thing I want to encourage you with, you might think about the life of missionaries as something that's spectacular and something that's unusual, extraordinary, and think, wow, they're going and doing something I could never do. Well, think about your life in terms of the, the specialness that it is whenever you see God doing work. What did it take for you to become a Christian? What circumstances did God put into place to bring you to himself? That was something that was miraculous. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, blinded by the God of this world, without any hope in the world. You were under the wrath of God. What does it take for someone that's spiritually dead to be enlivened spiritually? It takes a work of the, the Spirit of God, and he did that in your life if you are a Christian. And he placed you in Christ, and you're a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And wow, what a marvelous thing. And he's brought you to this local church. Well, how did that take place? It, it may have seemed like it was a circuitous route, but he brought you here in his sovereign plan and is giving you opportunities to serve him. And like we're planning to go down to Peru and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and strengthen local churches and plant indigenous churches alongside of the faithful Christians that are there, working alongside of local Christians, not depending on our own selves to get all the work done because God is working through his spirit through the people that are there and doing a work, and then training up the next generation of church leaders and building up the believers. Those are the things that you're about here, and increasingly so, and I've been encouraged to hear that as you're studying the Word of God and teaching it to one another and, and taking uh, great effort to know what God says and to live it out. I, I want to encourage you that the work that you're doing here is, is no less valuable in the kingdom of God, the outworking of his plan, as it would be for God to send some of us to some other place in the world, learn another language, learn another culture, and do what uh, God has called there, called us to do there. Why don't we go to Scripture now, and uh, you can turn to Isaiah 49. On your way there, uh, I want to read for you from 1 Corinthians 2. As I've, uh, over the past few days, I was listening to some lectures on preaching, 
and the weight of that responsibility really has has come full force on, on my life as I'm thinking about the task that it is to stand up and proclaim the word of God. And I found, I was reminded of this passage in, in 1 Corinthians 2, I'll read it to you. And it, it gives encouragement and hope that if someone is humble, as we're humbly speaking, preaching, teaching the word of God, dependent upon his spirit, the end result can be something that is, is, is a representation of the power of God and for his glory, and that's not dependent upon human wisdom. Listen to these words. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with the excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. Isn't that encouraging? That as we depend upon the Lord to preach his word, to proclaim his truth, if we come like the Apostle Paul apparently did, in weakness, in the right kind of fear, or the fear of the Lord, and in trembling, recognizing that he, in and of himself, with all the, the specific calling and the giftedness that God had placed in his life, he was not sufficient for the task. And his speech... Even if it were, were with persuasive words or with human wisdom, it wouldn't have been worthwhile, but a demonstration of the Holy Spirit and of power so that our faith would not rest in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. Now that is something to look forward to. And as we think about the Word of God and as it's preached and taught, I hope that we think about our own lives and, and as we listen to preaching that we're listening to God speak. If someone is faithfully proclaiming the word of God and, and you're hearing that here at this local church week in and week out, someone is, is, is explaining to you what God is saying and what you ought to do about it. And as we look at Isaiah 49 today, I think that's what you're going, you're going to see that very, very clearly. If you're familiar with or not familiar with um, the book of Isaiah... It's a message to Jerusalem and to, and to Judah, and, and it's proclaiming really through the, the first part of the book that sinfulness has run rampant. Rebellion towards God has been the norm, and people have turned from God. And that is so characteristic, not just of the people of Israel, but really the whole human race, isn't it? If you're here today and you're not a Christian, maybe you you don't fully understand that. What, what do you mean rebellion and, and sinfulness and wickedness? I look at my life and I'm, I'm better than this guy over here and I'm better than this person over here and on the whole of my life, I haven't done these wicked things. You know, maybe I lied here and there, but I haven't, I haven't stolen anything from anybody. I never murdered anybody. I've never committed adultery. I haven't done any of those things. I'm not, I'm not guilty, am I? Well, when we look at the Word of God, we see that something... Something terrible has happened and something so wonderful has happened after that. Well, something, something beautiful began. God created the world. And when he was creating the world, part of his creation was human beings. He created Adam and Eve. And they had perfect communion with him. They could walk with him. They could talk with him. They had a relationship with him. Similar to you would have relationships with other people. You can see them. You could talk to them. That was the way they interacted with God. Well, what happened? Well, God had placed them there in the Garden of Eden and he said, you can eat of the, the fruit of, of all of these trees. You can enjoy all that I've created and it's all for your good, but do not eat from the fruit of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because he, he had told them the day that you do that, that you will certainly die. What was God doing? He was inviting them to depend on him as, as their king. Well, what happened after that? A tempter came. A liar came. Satan came in the form of this serpent who was the, the craftiest of all the, the animals, apparently, as, as God's word says, that God had created. And he comes with lies on his lips and in his mouth and says, has God really said that you shouldn't eat this? You won't surely die. Basically, what he was trying to, to tell them was, this God that wants to be your king, he's no king at all. He's no, he's no one to be trusted. If you trust him, you'll end up withholding things from from yourself. You won't take things that you need. But if you eat this fruit, you'll be wise. 
and you'll be like God, discerning good and evil. Did they believe the truth or believe the lie? Well, they believed the lie. And Eve took that fruit and she ate it, disobeying God. Adam took the fruit, he ate, disobeying God. That plunged the human race under the consequence of their, their sin. And we see the effects of that curse from that sin in the world today. When you and I were born, we're born in that sinful condition, a blindedness to spiritual things, spiritually dead, not alive. And, and we continue to perpetuate that choice of sinning and sinning and, and disobeying God. And we continue to reject God as our, as our king. Well, God is a gracious God. And he desires to have a relationship with his creation. And if, if you look at Isaiah 49, I think you'll see that. Well, how does God... What is his plan for reinstating that relationship? It would take something outside of ourselves, wouldn't it? Because a dead person can't do anything for himself. A spiritually dead person is not, un, is not able to provide spiritual life for himself. He needs someone to do something for him, to do everything that he cannot do. Well, the way God has, has brought that truth to us is, is he's spoken to us. And we see here that in Isaiah 49 that there's a message coming from God and it's one of global proportions, and it's a message of hope because there is one that's come that can take our sin and pay for it, can make a, a sufficient sacrifice to, to give us access to God and that relationship with him that we need. Let's read in Isaiah 49, where it says, Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you peoples from afar. That can seem... Poetic, and we might not understand what, what's being said here. What, what's being said here? This one, this servant who we know to be Jesus Christ, the God-man, the Son of God, he's giving his, his invitation to listen. And who's his invitation to? It's to the coastlands, it's to the islands, it's to people that are scattered all throughout the globe and peoples from afar. If you live far away, out on an island, or if you live on the mainland somewhere, wherever in the world you are, listen to me. And because we're in sin, because we're under the consequence of sin, this ought to spark some hope in our minds. If you're not a Christian, this is the, the life, this message that will be proclaimed about the servant and through the servant, Jesus Christ, is the hope that you need. If you're a Christian, this is the hope that you need to live in. This is, what, this is the person that we need to hear from. And if we follow the normal course of our lives, making decisions for ourselves, what's going to happen? We're going to see people around us, we're going to see in the broader culture, in society, people saying, come here and do this. Follow me and do this. And you will have friends and family that will invite you to do things that are disobedient to God and to His Word. And if we follow that course, we'll be further separating ourselves from God. We'll be walking the way of ignorance and not the way of truth. And when God speaks, He brings wisdom to bear on our lives. We're walking in ignorance. We're unaware of what God says and He reaches out to us and He speaks to us and He gives us truth. That's what He's doing here. Listen, O coastlands, to me and take heed, you peoples from afar. And He tells about the ministry that God has given Him. The Lord has called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother. He has made mention of my name. This is a prenatal calling. The servant is commissioned by the Lord from before His birth. God specially prepares the way for His servant. We see... Scripture speaking with a unified voice that they're, they're looking for this one that would come. And then the really amazing thing about these prophecies and about this prediction is this, these predictions are happening around 700 years before Jesus Christ was even physically born on the earth. Isn't that amazing? We can look back on this and, and, and take other Scripture from the New Testament and realize, oh yes, this is Jesus. The people that were reading this, even some, the prophets that were writing some of these things down, they inquired to know, diligently searched out when the Spirit of Christ would be made manifest. And God didn't fully reveal that to them. But we hear the, the full revelation of God's truth in all of His Word telling us, telling us about this one. And what, what's He like? Look at verse 2. And He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. I think you're going to see in this, this passage, like in so much of the rest of Scripture, that 
it's necessary for us to take a passage in its particular context and to work through the argument to see, just like we do in other, would, would do in other literature, and other, you read a newspaper, you read a book, you're going to start at the beginning, typically, and work your way through to follow the, the flow of thought and of the argument of the author. We would do that with Scripture. And as we do that, we hear God speaking to, through His Word, from other places that give greater insight and connecting points to other parts of Scripture. If this, this servant, if Jesus has... a his mouth has been made like a sharp sword. What does that mean? Well, we think of other scripture that, that sounds like this and tells us these things. Like Isaiah 11, 4, He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. He shall kill the wicked. Or Revelation 1, 16, And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Revelation 19:15, And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. Revelation 19.21, And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth. What's happening? When, when Jesus speaks, the words coming out of his mouth are like a sword. They come to cut down. But is that similar to other people that cut down, that mow down human beings around the world? You think about the dictators and tyrannical rulers that we've seen throughout the history of the world and continue on to today. People that will take their decree and, and make it, and it, it causes destruction, and people die because of what they say. Are they speaking out of truth and justice and equity and holiness and righteousness? Most of the time they're not. Is that the same as Jesus? When he, some people would look at Jesus and see him, that he does all these things and say, well, that's not my God. I have a friend of mine from... From college, he was a roommate of mine, and when we were in college together, I knew him to be someone that believed the Bible and that professed to be a Christian. Well, he still professes to be a Christian, but his view of the Bible has changed. He says that really you can't trust, he, his, his trust in the inerrancy of God's word has faltered because he looks at things like this that you'd see in Revelation about Jesus with the sword coming in his mouth, bringing uh, just retribution on all those that have rejected him and rejected God and his salvation. Or you see in the Old Testament where um, God brings plagues on people or when he uh, takes the Canaanites, expels them from their land and, and brings the death on those people that have, that have disobeyed him. Well, this friend of mine says, well, you can't trust that part of Scripture, so I, I've realize that I can't hold in balance the, the things that we find in the Bible and this concept that God's word is without error. Is he thinking rightly about God's word or is he wandering toward a path of, of error himself? I think that's exactly where he's headed because what, what else can we do than believe what God has, has told us? And if God says something... That's exactly what he's going to do, and he's going to do it in exactly that way. And if Jesus is one that has a sharp sword coming out of his mouth, we have to know that it's, it's with that work that he does is going to be in keeping with his character. He will not do something that's wrong. That he will not do something that's evil. He will do exactly what is right. So we can trust when this, when this sword comes out of his mouth that it's actually... Truth, And we actually know that it is because we have other metaphors in Scripture. Think about the, the armor that we as Christians can put on that's given to us in Ephesians 6. And verse 17 tells us, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. And we know from Hebrews 4.12 that the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it pierces even into dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. When Christ speaks, what he speaks speaks directly to our inner being and who we are. He speaks directly to our need. And when we're in sin, he says, you are going the wrong way. Your sin will lead you to death. It will separate you from, from me forever. And we ought to be so thankful that he, when he speaks, it's just like a sword piercing to us, through us, and into our inner being and exposing our greatest need. And in addition to that, look at verse 2. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me. There, specifically kept, 
by the Father to be sent out to do his will, and he's made like a polished shaft, like a polished arrow, and his quiver he has hidden me. And as I was studying, another passage came to mind where arrows are mentioned in Psalm 127, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Blessed is the man that has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. This gives us really amazing confidence as we're raising our children and our grandchildren. That it's, it's about more than us just looking good or protecting our own, our own reputation or that they would... I hope that they'll sleep better so I can get more rest or I hope that they don't mess up so that our family doesn't look bad. Is our life about all those things and raising our children? No, there's something greater than that because when God sends out his own son, he does it like an arrow. And when a mighty man takes, when a, when a warrior takes an arrow out and, and fits it to the string and draws it back and lets it go, what happens? He shoots it at the enemy and it brings destruction upon the enemy. It's, it's an attack. We can think of our raising our children and our grandchildren as teaching, training them in the Word of God so that when we send them out, it's more than just as good people. We send them out to speak the truth and to encounter people that are speaking lies and falsehoods, and they will have the truth in their minds and in their hearts, and as God brings them to life through His Spirit in Jesus Christ, they will be in Christ, of course, knowing that that comes through repentant faith in Jesus Christ alone, then they can stand up against evil and against the enemies of God and say, what you say is not true, and they're not going to be ugly about it, but they're going to stand unashamedly on the Word of God and with God's truth. Wow! Wow! We, if, we, if we have that perspective about parenting and about our own lives, what greater thing could we hope for in the lives of our children than to do just that? And that's just how God sends out His servant. He takes him like a, a sharp, polished arrow, ready to fit to the string and to launch out. And when he goes, he, he is an attack against the enemy. And the enemy is all around us. You know that to be true. The enemies come in the form of this part of us, that even in our state of being in Christ, we have this part of us that's called, referred to as the flesh that's trying to pull us away from God to do the wrong thing. We have enemies around us. We have the world, which is contrary to God, running against God's will and God's word consistently, constantly. And if you watch TV for any length of time, if you talk to people, your, your friends, your co-workers, and and they are in and of the world, you will feel that like a stream rushing against you, wanting to, over, wanting to just take you downstream wherever they're going to go. That's the world. And we know that Satan is an enemy that we face, that he comes as a roaring lion, not, not a sleepy lion, and a zoo, he comes like a roaring lion, seeking people to devour, and he would, he would want to swallow you up. We need to know that Jesus Christ is an arrow that's sent out to do God's will and to speak His truth and to come up against the enemy. And when we, when we listen to the message of who He is and what He's doing and what He intends to do in and through us, then we have confidence and we have hope that even though all the forces of evil and all the strategies of hell would come against us, we know that Jesus Christ will stand strong. And the church is what he has promised to build, though all those forces and strategies would come in all their full force against him. Look at verse 3. And he said to me, You are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward... my my just reward is with the Lord and my work with my God. What's taking place here? Well, the Lord says of his servant that I will be glorified through you. That was a promise that was made. Yet we see that, that Jesus responds, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just re reward is with the Lord and my work with my God. What's taking place here? Is this doubt and fear that's leading to sin, is that what's taking place with Jesus, with the servant of God, where he says, I've labored in vain. Every, everything that I've done is coming back empty. It's, it's, it's like vapor. It's here and then it disappears. The work that I'm doing, I've spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Is it sin on the part of Jesus? 
Absolutely not. It can't be. He was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. It has to be something else. What would it be? What would be the, discour the discouragement of someone coming and proclaiming, the kingdom of God has drawn near, repent, and believe in the gospel. And then Jesus, as he's marching toward Jerusalem to do exactly what the Father has called him to do, for people to, to say, he's not the Messiah, he has a demon! You can't believe him! He's not speaking the truth. He was born out of adultery. He's, he's not a legitimate son. You can't believe him. The, the Scripture prophesies that he would come from Bethlehem and he came out of Nazareth. They don't even understand what Scripture says. They don't take the time to understand who he is. Though Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Some people respond to him with unbelief and rejection and say, if he's God, I don't want him. And if he says that you have to count the cost of being one of my disciples and you have to hate everything around you. You have to place everything, even your own life, in a lower priority than it is to follow me. That If he says that, then I can't follow him. And Jesus sees people like that day after day throughout all of history, time after time, that respond to him in that way. Even, even though he would look at them like he looked at Jerusalem, he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I have wanted to gather you like a hen gathers her chicks under her wing. But you're that city that rejects the prophets and stones those that come to speak the truth to you. And you were not willing to receive me. Wouldn't that be discouraging? Absolutely. Wouldn't it seem like your, your, your message and your life is empty? Well, it would seem like that. But Jesus, being the God-man, knows that there's more to his life and his service for his Father and doing the will of the Father than to have people reject him. Because he says, Yet surely my just reward, justice is with the Lord, and my work with my God. I can trust God to do his work. I can trust God to do exactly what he's promised to do. And we'll see here as we come to the end of the passage that God will do exactly what he has promised to do. And what he has promised to do is to bring some people to life. Not everybody's going to reject the Lord, but some people will. Some people, though, will fall down and crumble, crumple before the Lord and say, I can do nothing to save myself. I turn from my sin. My sin would keep me from you. I don't want it to do that. I believe that you're my Lord and you're my Savior. And those people have life. The servant knows that. Jesus knows that. That's what keeps him marching forward in his physical human existence toward the cross, knowing the anguish that will be faced spiritually and physically, he marches forward to do the will of the Father. And now the Lord says, verse 5, and he, and he reintroduces us to who the Lord is here in the rest of verse 5 before he says what the Lord says. And now the Lord says, and he tells us about the Lord. It's the one, he's the one who formed me from the womb to be his servant. So he's telling us, I have a reason to go and be his servant. He's the one that's been, been working the details to put this all together since we know before he was even born physically to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord and my, my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the... Preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, we could say a light to the nations, so that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Do you see it now? God's plan for all of existence, has, all of, of time in history, has not been just to save this people of Israel. We see even in Genesis, when, he's, when God is using Abraham and calling him, He's calling him so that the salvation that he provides would extend to the world through him and through his descendants. That's what God has always wanted. And through Jesus, that comes into to full view. And his plan, the outworking of his plan is now realized in all of its, all of its authority and with all of its hope. And, he, and God says, for you it would be a small, insig insignificant, light thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob. If you would just bring back Israel to me, that would be, we know it, looking at Israel, and as I heard in a Sunday school class this morning, and looking at other parts of Isaiah, that there, there will be a remnant, and we don't, that may be just a few. By and large, there'll be, people will reject 
the Lord, even from the chosen people of Israel. But if you would bring back Israel to me, that would be a small thing. I have something greater for you, for my own glory and for the good of the human race. For all those sinful people that are out there that are separated from me, I have this great thing in store for them through you, Jesus, my servant. You're the Messiah. I want you to restore the preserved ones of Israel and I'll also give you as a light to the nations so that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. And this gives weight for us as we think of, to the argument about us going and being ambassadors for Christ wherever in the world he would take us. Is it absurd, is it ridiculous to think that someone like myself, growing up in middle class America, not studying a word of Spanish until I was 17, now God would would work out in His grace to give opportunities to learn and prepare through the circumstances of my life and, and Kelly's life and would prepare us to, and send us down to Peru to do His work. Absolutely, because Jesus' message is for all people in all places at all times. He is a light, we know, to the world. And it's, I've been studying John recently and you can see there in the first chapter of John as John the Baptist sees Jesus coming on the scene, you can, you can just feel the emotion in his voice as he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. If, you're looking to, if you want to sacrifice lambs, you know, spotless lambs, and do that century after century after century, you still need a perfect lamb. And now Jesus is here, and He's the Lamb of God, and He takes away the sin of the world. If you find yourself in a sinful state, person that's not a Christian. Christian, if you find yourself giving in to sin, recognize that Jesus is your Savior. And if you'll say, I, I know you're my Savior. My, you're my Lord. I want to serve you. I want to do your will. You know what He'll do? He'll empower you through His Spirit to actually do His will. You'll walk in the Spirit. You won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. You'll be doing the will of God. God will be glorified. And you'll be working and serving in the local church and other people will be encouraged in their faith. These are tremendously incredible Benefits of the grace of God through the person of Jesus Christ. And that is what God the Father intended. That's why He sent Him. That's why He shot Him like an arrow into the world at the, in the fullness of time to be born as a man and to be born as Jesus and to be the God-man. That's exactly why He came. So that He could live the life that we could not live. The perfect life in contrast to our imperfect life, a sinless life in contrast to our sinful life. And he could take all our sins. Actually, God could place them there on him on the cross. And Isaiah 52 and 53 gives a fuller explanation of what is actually taking place there. And God the Father crushes him under the weight of all of our sin. Imagine that. Imagine, look, think about all your, your sins, the sins of your mind, the sins of your mouth, the sins of your, your eyes and of your actions, the places you, you have gone with your feet, the, things, the ways that you have disobeyed God. God takes all those sins and He compounds all the sins, all the sins of all of us and He, and he places them on, on Christ on the cross and it, that crushes Him. He who was not sinful in any way became sin for us. He did not become a sinner. He became sin for us. He, he took on our sin. It's like a song you might uh, be familiar with, His Robes for Mine, a wonderful exchange where he, he takes our filthy robes representing our sinfulness and he, and he puts them on Himself and He takes His righteousness and He, he clothes us with that. And now we, if we stand in Jesus Christ, we, disclaim, we stand legally declared righteous. So when the gavel falls in the courtroom, He says, not guilty if you're in Christ. Isn't that an amazing thing? That's an amazing thing. Well, I want to go to Acts 13 to finish because we see where this passage is, is applied in, in uh, actual story. Here in Acts 13, you have the church at Antioch and there, there were people, there were prophets and teachers faithfully serving God. Barnabas and Saul were among that group. It's from that church there in Antioch or in Acts 13 that in the working of the Spirit of God through those people where he, the Spirit of God says separate Paul and Barnabas Saul and Barnabas for the work that I've called them to and the people fast and pray they discern the will of God and God reveals that to them yes these two men these, they're faithfully serving here at Antioch I, I want them to go and do a missionary task somewhere else in the world I've, I've called them to that 
So they lay hands on them. They send them out to do that work. And that gives us instruction for local churches, that local churches are what God is using to send out people. It's not just the imagination of my own mind or any other missionary's mind or even your mind of what you want to do here. Depend upon the way God is working through the leadership of the church and mature believers to, and depending upon the Spirit of God and the Word of God to give insight to your particular life and what you should do. So if, if your pastor or if mature Christian friends here in the church say, have you considered serving in this way? Teaching this Sunday school class, going on this mission trip, being a part of this, this work team that's going to work at the camp. Have you considered working with the children's ministry? Have you considered whatever it is and all the opportunities that you have to serve God here through local church? Have you considered being a part of the soccer camp and sharing the gospel with, with people that have never heard it? Maybe you ought to take that into consideration that God is, is working through those people that you can trust as they're depending upon the Word of God. They're not, they're not perfect people, but they're, they're depending upon the Lord and His direction just as these people here work here at the Church of Antioch to, to call and distribute his servants, through his disciples, in the local church to do his work. Well, that was happening here at the church of Antioch. And as they're sent out there, they go to this place, they go to Cyprus, and they're, they're preaching, and there's opposition to it. And they go to Antioch in Pisidia, and Paul begins to preach, and he's, he's giving a narrative of how God's worked through the history of, uh, of the people of Israel and what he's done. And we see in we're going to cut to the chase in verse 23 that from this man's seed, referring back to David, and I'm going to read an extended portion of Scripture with some comments along through the end of the chapter, we are introduced to this man, Jesus, the person we've been studying about this whole time in Isaiah 49. God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus. After John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. So John was calling people through his ministry, to repent, turn from their sins, and then he points them to Jesus, believe in him. And as John was finishing his course, he said, why do you think, or who do you think I am? I am not he, I'm not the Messiah, but behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. This is a man that has an understanding of who Jesus is. He's not some common man. He's not just a, a really powerful, powerful prophet this is the God-man. He is the Son of God. And by, if, if anyone says that, it means that he is the same essence of, of God. There's this triunity that we see in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is God. Jesus is God. But I'm not him. I'm so unworthy compared to him. Men and brethren, verse 26, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. Wow! When you think about who Jesus is and the perfection that he embodies and the salvation and hope, there were actually people that, were, that rejected him to the, the extent that they would condemn him and they would kill him. Verse 28, And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, and we see insight there that it wasn't just wicked people doing wicked deeds for their own wicked goals, it was God fulfilling his preordained plan that what he had said and he was fulfilling, being fulfilled in exactly the way that he said. It gives us confidence that what God says in his word, he will fulfill. What God says, he will do exactly the way he's done it and exactly the time he's done it. We can trust what he said. He displayed that in, with a, in a powerful way in the death of his, of his son on the cross. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. They would have thought that, that they had won. Satan would have thought, I, I've got the victory. But God did the working of his plan and by his own power raised Jesus from the dead, conquering sin and its con consequence of death. And he was seen for many days by, by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. We know that he displayed many infallible proofs that he actually was alive, that he was Jesus raised to life again. Verse 32, And we declare to you glad tidings, 
That promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. I have begotten you. I have brought you to life. I have, I have raised you from the dead. Fulfilling what is there in the second psalm, in verse 34, and that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He spoke, has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. He wouldn't leave his body in the grave long enough that his body would decay. Verse 36, For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and saw corruption. So, we know that that psalm is not talking about David because he actually died and his, his body did decay. It must be speaking of someone else. It is. It's speaking of Jesus. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, everyone who believes is justified. Everyone that is who believes in him is declared righteous from all things which you could not be justified, you cannot be declared righteous by the law of Moses. If you're trusting in your fulfillment of the law, any law, be it Moses' law, your own laws, and you think that you could earn your way to heaven by doing good things, think again, God says, because the only way that you could be declared righteous is through the merits of Jesus Christ and what he's accomplished. Verse 40, Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. And this is a warning for all of us as you're hearing the truth of the Word of God and of the Gospel of Jesus Christ and of all His salvation, take this warning into your ears, let it sink into your mind so that you would not be like people that rejected the Messiah, that rejected Jesus Christ. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue and the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, to the Jews first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Why? And he points back to Scripture. He points back to Isaiah 49. For so the Lord has commanded us. I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, referring to Jesus, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. And what takes place? How do, pe- how do some of those people respond? Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. If you find yourself in sin and, and you, you think that your sin would separate you from God for all eternity, see here that as Jesus is a light that shines into the darkness to dispel the darkness of our sinful choices and our sinful lives, He is that kind of salvation for you particularly and personally if you'll repent of your sins and believe in Him as some of these Gentiles did and as many as have been appointed to eternal life believe God is in the saving business. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of this city raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. As we look at Jesus, let's recognize that he is a light, not just for one particular people, one particular ethnic group. He's a light for the nation so that the salvation that God has intended for throughout all eternity, would be coming to us, would be coming to you. Believe in Jesus today. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your truth. Thank you that we can have confidence that whatever you say is true and that as we live by it and live according to it, that you will give us your, the strength of your spirit to do your work. And I pray that that work would be seen in a powerful way here in this local church, that you would continue to do your work here in, in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ in this community that you've continued to send out from this number 
others to go in other places around this country and the world to share that same good news so that your name would be exalted. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.